Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Mandarin in Taiwan Forum. My name is Lotus Perry. I teach Chinese language and culture uh, at University of Puget Sound. I'm honored to join you from Tacoma, Washington as your host and moderator today. And I welcome all of you to join us uh, from various places as I understand uh, from the United States and also with many of our presenter today joining us from Taiwan early in the morning. I understand that among the forum attendees today, there are many students, teachers of Mandarin Chinese language, there are faculty and administrators from various schools and universities, as well as representatives from private and state agency. I know all of us are eager to put the worst part of COVID behind us and hope that international study and border crossing could become normal once again. And as we look forward to resume some of our existing programs, and many of us also hope to explore new options and maybe establish new programs that may better suit the needs of our schools, universities, um, and learners. So I think all of you will find that today's forum is a very timely event. So before I turn to our first speaker, well, let me acknowledge the organizer of the event, and that is the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Seattle, and who has been doing a lot of uh, reaching out to the local communities and has brought to us today uh, speakers from academia and government agency to share and discuss available resources from Taiwan. Uh, and we welcome a lot of representatives from our Ministry of Education in Taiwan. Uh, we also have Overseas Community Affairs Council support. We also have representatives coming from the Taiwan Mandarin Educational Resource Center. And today's event is going to be sort of roughly two parts. And the first part, um, we will have uh, some uh, welcoming remarks and also a keynote speech. And the second part will have more uh, really information sharing. And I encourage all of you to enter your questions throughout the event using chat. And uh, a couple of us uh, will be kind of monitoring it. And we will try to take a short break right after the keynote speech and to answer some of your questions. And then we will continue into our info session and we'll have a big block of time for Q&A. So without further ado, well, let me turn to Director General Daniel Chen from the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Seattle to provide the opening remarks. Chen Chujang. Thank you, Lotus. Uh, Director Rob Daly and Director General Dr. Nico Lee, uh, Deputy Director Dr. Jack Huang, and Minister, uh, former Minister of Education and Chancellor uh, Chao Shang Yang, and uh, Dr. Chen Han Li, and Mr. Stephen Chen, and my friends in, on the internet and dear friends. Good afternoon and good morning. I'm excited to welcome you all to join this, uh, uh, the first Mandarin in Taiwan Forum hosted by this office, the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in Seattle. Last December, Taiwan and the United States signed an MOU on international education cooperation, providing more opportunities for friends in the States to teach and then learn uh, Chinese in Taiwan and vice versa. So following upon this U.S.-Taiwan education initiative, today, TICO in Seattle is a thrill to host this webinar and introduce you the education opportunities scholarships and language learning experiences and resources in Taiwan. So recently we have all heard about the story about Harvard University, their Chinese program has been relocated to Taipei from Beijing, as well as many closure of the PRC's uh, Confucius Center in the United States, which demonstrate that one indeed plays a critical role in providing Mandarin instruction both to American friends and also to the people around the world. So Taiwan welcoming our culture, thriving democracy, robust economy, and highly educated and skilled workforce are most recent, and most recently, the uh, effective response to COVID-19 in the world may explain why Taiwan is the best choice to learn Mandarin, but most of important of all as Taiwan safeguard academic and intellectual freedom, and Taiwan always dedicate itself as a force of good and success, successful story of democracy. So uh, we are delighted to work with our colleague in TICO in San Francisco and the Overseas Chinese Association 
um, in Seattle to bring so many teachers and students in this virtual forum and talk about how we can enhance Mandarin language education. So this office will continue sharing information about scholarships and language learning resources on our Facebook, Taiwan in Seattle, to allow more people to learn about resources to learn to study in Chinese, uh, to, uh, to study in Taiwan and the United States. So hopefully we hope today's uh, program will offer you an opportunity to learn more about what resources Taiwan have to offer. And through this event, we also hope to find out what else we can do to help you succeed in studying Mandarin. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Director General Jin. Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Nicole Lee, and Dr. Lee is the Director General of the Department of International and Cross-Cultural Education of the Ministry of Education. And she previously served as the Director General of the Department of Higher Education of Taiwan's Ministry of Education, and prior to her latest appointment, she was working in London as the Director of the Educational Division at the Taipei Representative Office in the United Kingdom. And Dr. Lee is currently a member of the Board of the Foundation for Scholarly Exchange Fulbright Taiwan, a member of the Board of the Foundation of International Cooperation in Higher Education of Taiwan, just a man, many of her affiliation and membership. So let's welcome uh, Dr. Lee and Huan Ying Li Si Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Director General uh, Zheng, uh, Director Daly, and uh, thank you, Professor Perry. Uh, good morning and good afternoon for everybody. Uh, our distinguished participant in today's uh, forum. I am very happy to take part in this information session, especially as the United States Department of Education and this is International Education Week in the United States, uh, a joint initiative of the United States Department of State. And the United States Department of Education, so it's another opportunity to celebrate the benefits of international education and the exchange worldwide. So uh, language education play an important part in international understanding and uh, cooperation. So uh, uh, Taiwan is steadily working to achieve the goal of becoming bilingual by 2013. So this is now one of our key education tasks. And the more and the more education institutions in the United States want to offer Chinese uh, language course. That's uh, so wonderful. For this reason, in December last year, Taiwan and the United States signed the U.S. Taiwan Education Initiative to push the already well-established language education cooperation between us. So this, this is also will give the young people in Taiwan and in the United States more opportunity to learn each other's language and the culture and the interact in modern the democracy environment. Taiwan is a modern open society our Chinese language teaching is very well established, and we would like to share uh, its strengths with more school, college, and uh, university in the United States. Taiwan's Ministry of Education provides resources to support Chinese language learning at the all level. For example, we can surprise a suitable qualified teacher and a teaching assistant to school, college, and university for all of you. They share their expertise and the teaching method with their college and also help develop curriculum. We also offer a range of programs to help students develop their Chinese language skills 
and help the educator publish their Chinese language teaching lesson. For example, society's summer training course in Taiwan for guru of student or teacher. We are very welcome you all come to Taiwan. In conjunction with the U.S. Taiwan Education Initiative, the Ministry of Education launched the Taiwan Huawei Best Program. Uh, Dr. Zheng Handi will introduce a little bit about this information for you later. So under this program, university in Taiwan can set up the partnerships with the university in the United States to set up joint language education cooperation. So uh, Taiwan looks forward to working together more with people in the United States to provide language education for your students and uh, our students. And we, we all also look forward to welcome more teachers and students from the, from the United States to Taiwan. So now Taiwan is a very, very uh, safety country. So we very welcome you come to visit us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Thank you. We're all very excited about all these possible opportunities. Um, we're so excited today that um, in addition to information sharing today, we have a special, we're brought in a special keynote speaker. Uh, before I turn the microphone to uh, our speaker, I just want to give you a little introduction, although a lot of you probably know uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Robert Daly very well already. Uh, Mr. Robert Daly was named as the second director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States at the Ojo Wilson Center in August 2013. And he came to the Wilson Center from Maryland China Initiative at the University of Maryland. And prior to that, he was the American director of the Johns Hopkins University and Nanjing University Center for Chinese and American Studies in Nanjing. And Mr. Daly began work in U.S.-China relations as a diplomat and serving as cultural exchanges officers at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing in the late 80s and early 90s. And after living, leaving the foreign service, and he taught Chinese at Cornell University and worked on television and theater projects in China as a host, an actor, a writer, and helped produce Chinese language versions of Sesame Street and other children's television workshop program. But during the same period, he also directed the Syracuse University China Seminar and served as a commentator on Chinese affairs for CNN, The Voice of America, the Chinese television and radio stations. And from 2000 to 2001, he was American director of the US-China Housing Initiative at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And Mr. Daly has testified before Congress on US-China relations and has lectured as scores of Chinese and American institutions, including the Smithsonian Institution, the East-West Center, the Asia Society, and the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. And Mr. Daly has lived in China for 11 years and has interpreted for Chinese leaders, including Jiang Zemin and Li Yuanchao, and American leaders, including Jimmy Carter and Henry Kissinger. Well, so let's welcome Mr. Robert Daly. Thank you, Lotus. Uh, thank you, Daniel. I'm very glad to be with all of you tonight. Uh, there's one very important piece of my uh, career in U.S.-China relations that was not in that uh, very long introduction. Thank you. And that is that I spent an absolutely unforgettable year studying Chinese full time in Taiwan. Uh, and that was absolutely instrumental to everything that I've been able to do since. Uh, I didn't start studying Chinese until after I had graduated from university. I know that the students of many of, of the teachers who are on tonight are able to start younger, and that's great. You can, there are now programs where we can begin in elementary school, in high school. They can get a much earlier start. Uh, but the great trick to Chinese language fluency actually isn't when you start. 
it's staying with it, it's continuity. Uh, in my case now, 35 years in which I continue to be uh, a student of the language, which has been extremely enriching. I want to talk to you tonight about why I think Taiwan is such a terrific place to conduct Chinese language studies. Uh, but I also want to make it clear that in saying this, uh, I'm not intending uh, this is an attack on mainland China. Uh, my debt to mainland China and to Taiwan uh, is enormous in both cases, and I miss both places very much. I hope to get back both to the mainland and to Taiwan uh, as soon as I can after COVID. And obviously, having been uh, involved with the Hopkins Nanjing Center, I have been a great advocate uh, for Americans studying Chinese in mainland China. But we also have to acknowledge that the conditions for students in mainland China and the conditions for foreigners generally in mainland China have changed. Whereas the conditions for foreigners and for students in Taiwan uh, have always been wonderful and they remain wonderful. And so I, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I see this, as I say, not, not um, as an attack on the mainland, but really from the point of view of students uh, and learning because the challenge of this language uh, is enormous, it's difficult. One of the most striking differences, of course, has already been touched on, which is the openness and freedom uh, within Taiwan. And this is one of the things that has changed dramatically uh, in China over the last number of years, and I'm afraid is, is, is getting worse uh, almost by the month. As you know, as a language student, it's extremely important to be able to form full, natural, open, free friendships and to be able to discuss what's really on your mind, whether it is social or cultural or political or technological, uh, whatever it may be, many of these areas are now uh, constrained and are seen as sensitive in China. But it's really finding ways to discuss what matters most to us that drives us. It's a major motive for studying Chinese. And you wanna be able to have free discussions without worrying that you're putting your friends in peril. And this can't be done in China anymore. Uh, likewise, travel, free intercourse, moving around institutions, moving around communities is an important part of the overseas studying experience. Uh, there's a very real question about how open China will be uh, after COVID, uh, whereas Taiwan is has, has been mentioned. It's an open, modern society. Uh, when I was studying uh, Mandarin in Taiwan, I also worked four days a week in what was then Taipei's only stained glass window factory as a designer. It was very easy to, to do that, uh, to uh, make friends and chew beetle nut with them, frankly, and go on fishing trips. That kind of free uh, intercourse can't really happen anymore. In fact, one of the great appeals of studying in China until recently was that you could do college study, undergraduate, graduate study, and then stay on in China for a number of years in Beijing or Shanghai, and you could go from startup to startup and do some TV uh, advertising work, whatever it was you wanted to do, and you could just hang around and absorb the culture. The visa laws, unfortunately, have been changed in China such that you can't do that anymore. They've classified A, B, and C workers, and if you don't fill one of those fairly rigid categories, you finish your language studies and you're out. But the, it's not just the broad environment in Taiwan, it's also the classroom. Uh, you have to, especially at the intermediate levels, be able to discuss history. You have to be able to discuss ideas. When you get to the intermediate level, uh, ideally your jiao cai, your, your, your textbook should be based on current events. You have to be able to butt heads. And this is something that they do extremely well uh, in Taiwan. The other nice thing, frankly, about studying Chinese in, ta in Taiwanese classrooms uh, is that it is a somewhat this is, it's, I don't know quite how to put this. There's a sense in which it's a purer form of the language because uh, the part, the Communist Party in, in China has so changed Chinese in many of the textbooks uh, that it, it has a sort of a stilted quality. The great Belgian sinologist uh, Simon Lays said that reading Chinese Communist Party documents is like munching rhinoceros sausage. It's a heavily politicized uh, less mellifluous version of the language, which you do have to master. You have to you have to learn this and learn to deal with it. But I think in the classroom, it's much better to deal with the, the language of Hu Shi and Li Yutang uh, as you can in the Taiwanese classrooms. And I believe it's also important to study both uh, what in America anyway we call the classified 
the original characters as well as the simplified characters. It's important to learn Juyin Fu Hao as well as Pinyin. You need both because studying Chinese should give you access to the full range of modern Chinese culture. And of course, in Hong Kong, they're still using classical characters and simplified characters in Singapore. You need to have both of them. And then very importantly, and this is something I've been saying about foreign language study in Chinese for many years. One of the problems for American and foreign students in a lot of mainland Chinese universities, this is sort of a delicate point too, I'm sorry, that a lot of this is, is tricky to put out there, but you tend to be treated by host Chinese colleges as a Wai Bin first and a student second. A Wai Bin is a foreign guest. And the Wai Bin function is a propaganda function. Job number one of Chinese, mainland Chinese universities that host foreign students is to make sure that they have, that they like China. And job two is studying Chinese. Studying Chinese is too hard. You need what Taiwan has, which is absolutely rigorous, nose to the grindstone programs like you get at, at Taiwan Normal University and the National Taiwan University, places that are really going to uh, put you to the test and not spend a lot of time on the wiping stuff. And then lastly, uh, and I've been thinking about this a lot in preparation for this talk tonight, uh, there's just the, the graciousness of Taiwan that comes from its openness, its modernity. Uh, it's a place your students will find of great beauty and variety. I studied up on Yangmingshan, north of Taipei City, beautiful mountain covered with hot springs and, and, and butterflies and gardens, also a lot of poisonous snakes. Uh, but you, you don't really see those, they tend, they tend to hide out. There's also ac across Taiwan, tremendous geographic variety for people to enjoy. It's a city, Taipei, of coffee houses and tea houses and bookstores and way too much pineapple pastry uh, for, your, for your students to indulge in as well. Taiwan is a place that still really cherishes, practices and continues the traditional Chinese arts. I remember particularly the modern ceramics uh, in Taiwan are among some of the finest in the world. And so this is all readily accessible to your students who go to Taiwan. It's easy to participate. They can go hiking up on Qi, uh, Shan uh, and really throughout the island. And Taiwan, of course, uh, you probably all know this, might be the single best place on earth to eat. And even mainland Chinese will admit this. It's one of the, the great pleasures of study in Taiwan, of going to Ding Tai Fung, uh, it's an international cuisine that they'll be able to take uh, part in. There was one of my favorite restaurants in the world was up in Tianmu, was run by a Taiwanese who returned from America. And the first half of every day, it was an American pancake house until noon. And then it became Tex-Mex until dinner. And I would go there and simply study all day, uh, eating all of those meals. The Taiwanese publishing industry, I still have, this is, I've got a little prop, all of the children's books that I bought when I lived in Taiwan, and from which I learned Chinese poetry, Chinese history, uh, Chinese fables, all of my Cheng Yu. Uh, you can see I just marked them up. This is now more than 30 years old, um, but my vocabulary lists were on these. And so the bookstores pay attention to Chinese language teaching in a way that's easier to locate uh, than it is, frankly, in mainland China. But there are more advantages to that. Uh, frankly, for many of your students, uh, if they're people of faith, the freedom of religion that you have in Taiwan is a great point of entree into Thai Taiwanese culture. You can join a parish. You know, yet another way to make friends and get involved. Uh, there are marvelous museums. Your students can get involved in the arts, in media, in the corporate world and in non-governmental organizations, including activist organizations in Taiwan. There are many of them. Those have largely been closed down now in China. And because under Xi Jinping, most Chinese workplaces are more controlled and managed by the Communist Party, they're not as accessible as they used to be to foreign students, but they still are in Taiwan. You could probably even get involved in politics in Taiwan in one way or another. Uh, I'm sure that there are legal constraints there, but it's available. So I think these all at this point make great selling points, good medical care. Taiwan is a great jumping off place to Korea, to Japan, uh, to Southeast Asia. And again, it's that in comparison to a China which is shaped by uh, an increasingly repressive 
government domestically. It's a, and it's increasingly aggressive internationally. And U.S.-China relations are getting worse. And unfortunately, I think that's going to continue to be the trend. Um, Daniel mentioned that the Harvard Beijing Academy relocated permanently to Taiwan. And that wasn't really a function of COVID. This had been in the works for a while. You can be sure that Harvard was very hesitant to do this because Harvard has uh, educated an awful lot of China's leaders and its, its children's leaders. It cares deeply about its relations with China. They did this, quote, because of a perceived lack of friendliness on behalf of the Chinese host university. Before COVID, they were no longer allowed to celebrate the 4th of July on campus and to sing the American national anthem. That's the way that space is being restricted in China. It didn't used to be true, and we don't know how far this adversarial relationship between the United States and China is going to go. The signs right now are bad. Uh, they just rewrote 100 years of Communist Party history in order to table for Xi Jinping as a lifelong leader uh, who also ha is building up a cult of adulation. He is carrying out a commercial and cultural rectification campaign which includes attacks on things like English language education. And the surveillance state is growing. The build out of facial recognition technology, uh, big data uh, and uh, high vision cameras all over China to survey the populace. So I'm not saying don't go to mainland China. Again, and I, I realize that might be seen as sending mixed messages here. This situation is changing quickly. As I say, I do miss China badly, and I've got many, many dear friends and places that I love in China. Uh, I'm not, and I'm also not saying that China is the source of all uncertainty in the relationship. The, uh, America has uh, some blame in this too. It was the American side that canceled the Fulbright program in China, and canceled the Peace Corps uh, in program, uh, the Peace Corps program in China. But I did say at the beginning that really effective Chinese language study requires continuity. I said my own, in my own uh, experience now, it's, it's 35 years of continuity. But at every point in your language studies, no matter where your students are, they need to be able to build through a program. They require continuity. And continuity in language study requires predictability. Your students need a multi-year plan for their Chinese language studies. And I am not saying that China, mainland China, is unsafe. I am saying that it's uncertain. It's uncertain. We don't know when it opens up. We don't know what openness looks like. And we do know that the atmosphere is going to be tougher for free and open studies. Uh, that predictability that is needed in your language studies, I think, is going to be more and more difficult to attain if you have a mainland-focused program. You will not find these obstacles in Taiwan. And I also, just lastly, as a pitch, uh, as you probably know, uh, American enrollment in Chinese language studies is going down. Study abroad is going down. This is a huge problem. Chinese language study has never been more important in the United States, and I wish it were available as a K-12 option in American public schools. Your students are going to have a chance, if they can stay with Chinese language studies, and they can study someplace like Taiwan, where they will be unhindered, and where they will have a fairly predictable course of study, your students are going to be able to participate in one of humankind's great conversations, which is what it means, you know, when Western and Chinese civilization come together in ways that are competitive, but not only competitive. Much of this coming together is also enriching and exciting, and your students will want to be a part of that. Nothing is more challenging uh, or important or more fun than long-term Chinese language study. And I think that actually Taiwan right now is just marvelously positioned to you know, once again really lead in this endeavor. So I hope you'll take advantage of it. Uh, and I hope you'll, if there's anything I can do to help with that, please feel free to be in touch. I think that, you know, especially at the lower grade levels, Chinese language study is vitally important. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. This is wonderful. I, I see that people are already posting uh, some questions and um, I, I want to uh, say that I, I think we uh, some of the questions regarding policy, travel policies, and uh, specific things about scholarship, we may want to wait until the uh, Q and A. If that's okay, uh, but I, I do want to say that um, I think we take what uh, 
Robert has said in hard in many ways I mean, as a college educator. I think my students, we have Chinese majors and I have not been able to go abroad. Um, and many of them have been applied four or five times and each time we're being told, nope, the border is not going to open. So our best bet right now is hoping that uh, through one of the affiliated programs, CET, that have uh, uh, applied for a special permit to Taiwan's uh, government and hoping that some students can actually go uh, this coming spring. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. Yeah.